American University in Bulgaria. Um, we have a great pleasure to be, have with us here today Professor Paul Hollander. Professor Hollander has been on faculty at Harvard and has been on faculty at the University of Massachusetts. He has a long career, he is retired, and he has a long career in areas of the study of the Soviet Union, the study of communism as a political ideology, and the study of political violence. And his topic for today is going to be contemporary political violence and its legitimation. So he will speak for about 30 minutes or so, I think that's what we've agreed, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay? So thank you once again. I hope the microphone works and you can hear me well. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is my second visit to Bulgaria. I was here two years ago, but only in Sofia. And actually, I had one side trip to the monastery, to real monastery. So this time I will see a little more. Uh, let me just add to the introduction, the kind introduction that I retired from teaching, but I haven't retired from writing. So that's, you have to do something in retirement to entertain yourself. You, you may or may not know, and this is relevant to my interest in political violence, uh, that I grew up not so far from Bulgaria in Hungary. And in a rather turbulent period of history. And uh, that clearly, that's where the origin of my interest in political violence lies, also the origin of my becoming a sociologist. Uh, and uh, I will just mention a few aspects of my life in Hungary, which uh, predispose to these interests, morbid interests. My American wife thinks my interests are incredibly morbid. And how could I, I, I for example, I once edited a book, which is called From the Gulag to the Killing Fields, which meant reading a very large number of these memoirs of people from which I selected. So that was an occasion when my American wife, real American, I don't say, I don't think I'm a real American, not quite. So she's always astonished that I can read these depressing texts, which I can, strangely enough. So um, growing up with a good deal of political violence as a child, obviously, implanted this interest in this rather unpleasant phenomenon. Uh, to mention few few aspects or particular episodes of my life which uh, predisposed to this interest. Well, I grew up during World War II, so I remember as a child World War II very well, you know. I grew up in Budapest, and the city was bombed, and we lived in the air raid shelters, and there were dead bodies on the streets, but more important, uh, since I came from a Jewish family, there was, of course, Jewish persecution in Hungary, at least from late, from the spring of 1944. So uh, we had to go underground, so to speak, uh, with false papers. And uh, most of the Jews in Hungary, as you may or may not know, most of them were actually exterminated, shipped to Auschwitz and gassed. But most of the Jews in Budapest survived in the ghetto. When my family and I, we didn't go into the ghetto, we had these uh, false papers which uh, alleged that we were refugees from Romania fleeing the Red Army. And the papers proved good, and we survived. I mean, they were checked by the police. We survived. But we knew, and I knew as a child, that if we had been found out, we would have been shot, because when they found somebody hiding, they shot them on the street or along the Danube. So uh, clearly political violence was an early experience. And I also remember, actually, <coughs> another personal detail. I used to, since I knew that if we were found, we would be shot. So I used to ask my father, my father fought in World War I, and he was injured in World War I. So I asked him, well, what does it feel like when a bullet goes into your body? 
he had a, he had a slight injury in his leg. He said, oh, no, it's nothing, don't worry about it, as a, as a good father. But anyway, so I survived, we survived all that. And then, uh, then of course, came the communist regime. But the communist regime was not life-threatening. And, uh, I mean, I, I won't go into the detail. But again, it is of some relevance for my interest in these matters, you know, political violence, coercion, regimentation. Well, Hungary was, as you know, very much part of the socialist commonwealth, so-called, or the Eastern Bloc, and had a Stalinist system for a while. And uh, Hungary had its short trials, just like Russia in the old days. There were short trials, and uh, here is another interesting little episode. In, in the gymnasium, when they had these short trials, we had to sign a petition. Everybody had to sign a petition that we, de we demanded the most severe punishment of the accused. And everybody signed it, because we knew that if we didn't sign it, we would have some trouble later on, such as not, not being admitted to the university. Now, another matter about my upbringing. Well, I was actually an early sympathizer with the communist regime because, after all, we were liberated by the Soviet army. You know, in a sense, they, they saved our lives, Jews, the life of Jews. But then the Soviet army itself behaved very badly. So there was more exposure to violence, approximately Estimates are to 10 to 15 percent of all women in Hungary were raped by the Soviet troops. And some of which, in a sense, I witnessed, in the sense that we were in these air raid shelters and the Soviet soldiers were going around raping women. So you could hear what was going on since the women were protesting and screaming and so forth. So finally, one more episode of political violence. Uh, during the 1956 revolution, when I was still in Hungary, <clears throat> of course, again, there were plenty of people killed on both sides, and lots of dead bodies on the street. And uh, I observed uh, when, a, when a Hungarian mob lynched some of these uh, Hungarian KGB people who were arrested, taken prisoner, but they were lynched. Not, not very nice. And, uh, oh, you know, there was another episode I remember as a child. There were some, right after the war, there were some executions on the street. <coughs> some Hungarian Nazis were hung on, on a lamppost in the <coughs> middle of Budapest. <coughs> well, so, I suppose uh, one's personal life has, a, has an impact on one's professional interests. So. It is some reason why I had this interest. <clears throat> but I was first interested in the political, in um, communist systems and totalitarianism. <clears throat> in any case, uh, let's move to the more general topics because we will run out of time. <clears throat> I have, I have written a number of books on, on which have to do with communism, totalitarianism, political violence, uh, the Western perceptions of uh, communism, intellectuals and politics, these kinds of topics. So I came to the conclusion, perhaps not very original, that uh, much of uh, modern political violence uh, has to do with its legitimation, that, that in, in, in more recent times, meaning the last century or so, it has become more important to legitimate political violence, that is to say, to, to explain it and to justify it and to attempt to create the impression in various audiences that uh, the political violence used was justified. And, uh, this, this can apply to wars, it can apply to revolutions, it can apply to internal repression. <clears throat> now, 
Whereas in the past, much of political violence was sort of simpler, and it didn't have much to do with ideas or ideologies or philosophies. But some people, it seemed to me, not that this is no longer the case, but people in the past, it seemed to me, predominantly fought over scarce resources, land mainly. Uh, and, and you know, there was no need for elaborate or lengthy justification why one country occupied another one, and, uh, or, or two colonies, or, or killed people who resisted them. But in modern times, uh, these ideological justifications greatly increased. And uh, if you look at any major wars in recent times, they had uh, political violence had lengthy and sometimes complicated uh, justification. Much of it actually boils down, much of modern, many of the, most of the justifications of modern political violence converge in the claim that it was a form of collective self-defense. That's the interesting, not only in wars, but also in uh, internal violence. You know. Now, of course, self-defense, in most cases, this was a very extended notion of self-defense and sometimes completely untrue and implausible. The Nazis, for example, seemed to believe genuinely that they had to exterminate the Jews because they were represented a mortal threat. So it was a form of self-defense. Communist systems, uh, their focus or their definition of their opponents was broader and more fluctuating and uh, it could be anybody who opposed the system, not necessarily a particular ethnic group, but they too believed that certain groups uh, represented a mortal threat. The Kulaks, for example, or members of the former ruling classes, uh, and they had to be exterminated. More recently, we have another, I think basically I, I looked at in my discussion of contemporary political violence and its legitimation, I looked at three movements or three political systems when one is not yet a system. Nazism, communism, and radical Islam. Well, that, that's the most recent. And uh, in all these three cases, I have been impressed by this congruence or continuity between ideas and behavior. People tend to assume that uh, in politics there is usually a huge discrepancy between belief and behavior or ideas and behavior, but I think in the case of political violence there has been a considerable congruence, that people really believed certain things, the Nazis, the communists, the radical Islam, that certain groups had to be dealt with, had to be exterminated uh, because they represented a mortal threat and they acted on their beliefs. So, unlike many other sociologists or social scientists, I always, I always believe that ideas do make a lot of difference to how people behave in, in political conflicts too. Now, it is also true that uh, many political systems uh, don't do what they preach. I mean, communist systems were notorious for making certain promises or promulgating certain theories which had very little reflection in reality. Now, I'm not talking about political violence or how to deal with the enemy, but as you well know, uh, no, you are too young, you, you, you have no reason to know, but maybe you read about these things. Communist systems, uh, for example, promised to create high standards of living, and that they claimed that the standard of living improving day by day and of course that wasn't true. All communist systems claim that they are based on popular participation and popular consent, but that was also completely untrue. A very interesting symbol, incidentally, and I don't know how many of you know about this, this communist obsession with uh, this mirage, this illusion of popular support, that they had these one-party elections, 
But it wasn't enough that there was only one party running for office. The way they voted, at least in Hungary, I don't know how it was in Bulgaria. Uh, in Hungary, in the communist days, and I participated in at least maybe one such election, if you voted for the system, all you had to do was to put the ballot in the box. You didn't have to write anything on it. But if you wanted to vote against the system, mind you, there were no alternative candidates, then you had to cross it out, and then you went into the polling booth. Needless to say, not many people availed themselves of this opportunity in a police state. So, you know, this was an issue, actually, the relationship between theory and practice. And maybe the Nazis came the closest to approximating it, more than the communists. Anyway, um, back to the legitimation of political violence. Uh, so there were particular groups singled out who represented uh, political evil. And uh, one reason, I think, also why legitimation of political violence became so widespread in modern times because of the rise of political propaganda. Well, in the old days, uh, there was no political propaganda to speak of because political propaganda requires a certain technology. You have to disseminate it. So you need minimum newspapers, radio, television, whatnot. And of course, uh, in the 20th century, that became available. So now you had the means to disseminate uh, political propaganda. Well, I think another reason because the, but why this legitimation became more important, because the number of people involved in political conflict and political violence has also increased. I mean, there, there have been, as far as wars were concerned, there was conscription, mass armies. They had to be motivated to some degree. The more elite troops required particular motivation, who were, you know, the spearhead, spearheading political violence, like the SS or the KGB. So, um, in some instances, uh, this kind of political indoctrination was also essential because people were made to do things they might have had some reservations about. Now, this is a much debated issue, especially in the context of Nazi Germany. Talking about political violence, to what extent the Nazis involved, whether they were regular conscripted soldiers or the elite troops, the SS, were they really motivated to kill the people they had to kill and whom they did kill, or did they just obey authority? You know, there is a famous book on obedience to authority by the American psychologist Stanley Milgram, who did, who did these experiments which suggested that it, it is easy to convince people to obey authority, even if in the course of doing so they inflict pain on others. But you you might have heard about this. So I don't discuss it at great length. Again, about the Nazis, there has been a great deal of dispute whether or not these people just obeyed authority in killing the Jews, or did they actually enjoy what they were doing, or they did it. Well, that's one motive you enjoy never mind ideology or obedience to authority, but just the sheer pleasure of it. Or they did it because they really believed that uh, you would create a better world by killing the Jews. And in fact, this is the common denominator of these three entities I was talking about, communism, Nazism, and radical Islam, that they all believe that uh, you will create a better world this is the major legitimation of their political violence, that you create a better world if you eliminate certain groups of people. And to the extent that you believe this, uh, this is a powerful motivation. Uh, let me see, there was a very good quote I had from an American uh, social scientist uh, about the, this, this applies to the motives of the Soviet elite, Soviet revolutionaries, and the, the American social scientist, who these days is even forgotten in America. His name is Nathan Leites, L-E-I-T-E-S. Anyway, he was a very good student of the 
Soviet or Bolshevik mentality. <clears throat> and he said the following. This has to do with this belief that you do these bad things in order to create a better world. It's an ends and means relationship. And he said <clears throat> the Bolshevik, well, you know the Bolshevik, that's another word for the communist. The Bolshevik must avoid free-floating empathy. Bolshevism shares the feeling expressed by a character in Dostoevsky's, in one of the novels of Dostoevsky, such as, it doesn't matter if one has to pass through filth, filth, to get there, as long as the goal is magnificent. It will all be washed off afterwards. Bolshevik doctrine rejects the virtue of empathy with and pity for all human beings. The awareness of distress of others would reduce one's capacity to perform those acts which would ultimately abolish it. Instead of feeling guilty about the suffering which one imposes on others, one attempts to feel self-righteous about actively imposing suffering on others for the sake of the future abolish, abolition of suffering, unquote. Interestingly enough, Himmler, you know, was Himmler, head of the SS, etc. He once, I don't have the quote with me, unfortunately, but he once made a speech to a group of assembled SS officers and leaders in which he made a somewhat similar point. The interesting thing was what he said basically was that he knows that what these SS leaders in the field, you are, who, who are actually involved with the extermination camps, and they see the piles of corpses of women and children and the gas chambers and the crematoria, that this is a pretty distasteful, unpleasant thing to look at and be involved on a daily basis. He understands that. But, he said, the fact that they were capable of doing it shows that they had a higher morality, so to speak, that they could face this. <clears throat> so again, this, this is this ends and means relationship which is so much involved with uh, political violence. And of course, as far as the Islamic radicals are concerned, they have an even, they are, not, they are not really convinced that they will create a better society by killing certain types of infidels, but they have a religious assurance that they will have these otherworldly rewards, which they apparently, many of them, the suicide bombers, genuinely believe. So that's a very powerful combination of uh, political and uh, religious motives they have. Or, um, but again, there are, of course, then the question is always, you know, what are the ultimate sources of this human capacity? to inflict political violence. And well, I was so far talking about ideas or, or beliefs or ideological convictions of creating a better world or defending yourself against some extremely uh, dangerous enemy. But in addition, one could also say that uh, there may be such a thing, but if you, if you, you were religious, then you could say, well, um, original sin, that human nature is ultimately sinful. But even if you are not religious, uh, which I am not, clearly one cannot ignore the fact that certainly human nature has its darker aspects, that throughout recorded history there have always been people perfectly capable of doing terrible things to other human beings and convincing themselves that this was truly justified and uh, not having any more conflict about this. I'll just tell you one more little anecdote on this topic, which is an interesting combination of uh, ideological motivation and uh, personal disposition. You heard about the Kachin massacres, probably not, some of you. Well, the Kachin massacres, when the Soviet troops, when they divided with Nazi Germany, Poland and the Soviet troops, arrested and put in prison of war camps, tens of thousands of Polish officers. Most, most of them were reserve officers, so they represented the Polish elite groups, educated Polish people. And in a place called Kachin, in 1941 or 42, 
they, they killed them, they shot them to death. In huge mass graves, about 20 or 25,000 of them. It's an interesting case also because uh, when those mass graves were first discovered, the Russians, the Soviet Union claimed that it was done by the Nazis, which had a certain plausibility. But there were tons of historical evidence that it was not done by the Nazis, but by the Soviet troops and NKVD, the political police troops who did it. But anyway, the anecdote concerns the following, that uh, a particular Soviet general who was in charge of these operations, and he, he, he didn't have to be personally involved in shooting anybody, but for some reason, I mean, this is, this is written up in a number of places, for some reason he took it up on himself to shoot personally several hundred of these Polish officers. And he put, put on a um, butcher's apron because, you know, not to be splattered by blood and particles of brain. And he just did this. He, he obviously enjoyed it. So you, you, you might say he was, a, he was a sadist or a pervert or a psychopath or whatever. But, but he was also, I am sure, convinced that he was doing something that was ideologically necessary and uh, had the Soviet system to survive. Basically, it was Stalin's idea. You know, this was anticipating the future after World War II that you eliminate uh, these uh, potential elite groups in Poland. So it will be easier to impose a Soviet system. In the same way, you know, the same mentality was reflected in the fact that when the Soviet troops were moving to Warsaw and then they stopped on the eastern side of the Vistula River and they encouraged the Polish resistance to have an uprising against the Germans, which they did, and the Germans put it down with great brutality and the Russians didn't have them, the Soviet troops didn't have them because they didn't sympathize with the politics of that resistance movement in Moscow. Anyway, um, I, just, I was going to mention one more thing, or one more aspect of perhaps human nature, which is also contributes to political violence and helps to uh, perhaps merges with these ideological currents, what I call the scapegoating impulse, or the satisfaction <coughs> people derive from righteous indignation and hatred when you feel that your violence is uh, retaliation or when you feel that you avenge victimhood. I think victimhood again is very important. And again the Nazis felt victimized uh, by the Jews, by the Western powers, uh, and the communists felt victimized by the capitalist surroundings or their enemies in society. Uh, so I think that's, a, that's again an important thing. And, and it's, it's a very ominous development when in any society you have a lot of people who feel victimized because those people are easy to mobilize for political violence. And then I wanted to say one more thing. I mean, there are a lot, lot of things to be said on this topic, but not within the amount of time we have now. That political violence can also be connected with modernity in the sense that modernity or modernization undermines social order, it splinters traditional communities, undermines traditional cultures, and creates uh, identity problems. Well, I don't know if, if this uh, concept of this idea made much progress in Bulgaria so far, identity problems, but uh, it's certainly a very important one in the United States and has been for a long time. And in fact, when I first arrived to the United States, I was totally puzzled by this idea that people don't know who they are. You know, an identity problem. How can that be? Well, what it means that people, a lot of people, don't think the traditional categories of identity, you know, like ethnicity or class or level of education, etc., that's not sufficient that there is something more important or more unique to define your identity. But anyway, people who have written about, for example, theories of totalitarianism, they claim that uh, totalitarian systems emerged in societies where a lot of people had serious identity problems, where traditions were undermined, or group solidarity was weak, and people were more available 
to be recruited or attracted to extremist movements, whether they were Nazi or communist or radical Islam. And in fact, more recently, I think it's a very plausible argument that much of this radical Islam is a kind of a protest against modernity. So uh, let me just say one more word about the part played by intellectuals, because we are running out of time. And I want you to have a chance to ask some questions or make comments. Uh, I have always been also interested in intellectuals and politics and intellectuals and violence. And uh, the part played by intellectuals is difficult to generalize, uh, generalize about intellectuals, you know, because there are no public opinion polls addressed to intellectuals as such. And it's a somewhat murky and disputed concept. But at least we can agree that intellectuals have become, might be called, or I call them, the, the major or the preeminent moralizing elite of our times, at least in Western societies. Now, in communist or totalitarian or other repressive societies, they certainly don't have much autonomy. But it might be argued that uh, insofar as some intellectuals or some groups of intellectuals supported radical or extremist or totalitarian systems, and insofar as they contributed to the development of various utopian designs, uh, they have also made, no doubt, an unintentional contribution to uh, political violence, because, you know, in order to create this supposed good society, uh, you had to engage in a great deal of this kind of purifying violence. There was one more point I should have made earlier, but I will mention it anyway, that when, when you look at the recent types of political violence, I think there are basically two major types. One was this highly organized one, such as the Nazis and the communist authorities engaged in, which led to these huge uh, numbers of people who were killed. But there were also some major outbreaks of more spontaneous kind of violence, which was not so highly organized and not centralized, and which also perhaps could be used to, uh, as, a, as, as, as a source of reflection about human nature. And these were outbursts of violence which the participants clearly enjoyed, more decentralized. I have in mind two such instances. One was the so-called Cultural Revolution in China which was a very much a decentralized mass activity, and the participants clearly enjoyed it, humiliating people in public, beating them up in public, sometimes killing them in public. That was a mass occurrence. It was not like, you know, lining up people against the wall or putting them in the gas chambers. And then there was another famous uh, outbreak of violence, which also had the decentralized aspect in Rwanda. Which, was, which had a huge number of participants. And uh, again, um, they performed this violence in, in good conscience. There, there has been a lot written about it. Uh, but that had to do with matters material, you know, taking the land from one minority, etc. Now, let me just say in conclusion that I didn't, to, I didn't want to insist that all modern political violence results from utopia-seeking or perverted idealism or nationalistic or religious fanaticism. Certainly there is also a great deal of violence and conflict connected with scarce resources as old-style conflict. Um, or due to the determination of power holders just to cling to power. But I do believe that many of the most uh, destructive forms of political violence in modern times uh, had these idealistic roots in various conceptions of the world purified of some type of evil. So that's how I will end. We have time for some questions. What I would like to have, ask is you would please um, just say your first name and also please um, tell us where you're from. So, questions? Okay. Thank you. I'm Boban Markovic. I'm coming from Serbia. And 
and states and territories generally where artificial identity of the population disappears, namely Yugoslavia in the 90s, namely Afghanistan if you consider plurality of tribes or Libya, after the artificial identity disappears, there is a certain gap which is very often filled with religion later on and a quest for new identity, which results in violence very often against each other. According to you, what would be the solution in those situations? How to overcome that drive for new identity and to protect peace? Well, I always feel very defensive and uh, impotent when somebody asks me what solution I propose to the various terrible things I have written about. Uh, but you know, uh, I mean, take something like the Kosovo conflict, where there was an attempt by the Western powers and NATO to do something about it. You could say, well, that was arguably a humanitarian intervention, but I'm sure that's not how the Serbs saw it. For the Serbs, it wasn't a humanitarian intervention, but it was taking sides of the Albanians. So, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that most societies or uh, communities are more peaceful and more violent, or, and less violent if they are more homogeneous, no question about it. And uh, it's very difficult, uh, again, obviously scarcities, material scarcities always aggravate tension and violence and hostility. But, uh, you know, I always think about, in the back of my mind, you know, some few, few fortunate little countries like those in Scandinavia or Switzerland, you know, when did the last Swiss person commit a suicide bombing or when did the last Swede assassinate somebody or, or engage in a pogrom? And of course, uh, cultures and particular developments uh, <clears throat> make a difference. And some, some societies are more peaceful for a combination of fortunate uh, historical circumstances. And I also always felt that, of course, political democracy is uh, by no means uh, typical of history. It's again a minority phenomenon in a few countries which managed to create stable political democracies. Uh, and um, even at the present time, when at least nominally there are more countries which are democratic and they have elections at least. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you ask me how do you resolve the kind of terrible political conflicts you have well, to a lesser extent now in the former Yugoslavia, but say in Afghanistan, you know, or uh, Pakistan. And uh, I don't have any original ideas. Uh, for instance, people sometimes think that education solves all problems. And people who are well educated are less prone to violent behavior. Well, that's sometimes true. It depends on the kind of education look at a lot of these suicide bombers, including the ones who flew into the towers in New York. They were very well educated. They had <clears throat> even Western education, many of them, and that didn't provide immunity against their fanaticism. And of course, the Nazis were, by and large, you know, <clears throat> Nazi, the Nazi movement had a huge support at the universities in Germany. So, uh, <clears throat> but I think maybe it depends, I'm sure it depends on the kind of education people get and how, how tolerant they become as a result of their education. I think that, that's really the crucial question, tolerance. Uh, to what extent people can tolerate uh, views which are radically different from their own. And for instance, take, it is a good example, a, a very bad example, of course, this kind of radical protest because somebody writes a book, Salman Rushdie, you know, that was a long time ago, or someone makes a movie which is critical or hostile to Islamic religion, or the cartoons in the Danish newspaper. So they just can't tolerate this, this disrespect. I mean, this idea that when somebody shows disrespect towards your group, 
you have to retaliate as brutally as you can, and you, you have to silence the people who engage in disrespect. But this is often religiously sanctioned and, and aggravated by religious uh, convictions. But this, insist, this insisted, insistence on respect and disrespect, this preoccupation, reminds me of the behavior of American gangs who are often violent, and they often justified their violence by saying that so-and-so disrespected me, so I shot him. End of dispute, no more disrespect. You killed the booksellers who sold the books of Salman Rushdie, so you stop disrespect. So I think this, this is, of course, a very ominous and destructive human potential, the demand for this kind of respect, and. Uh, the belief that you are somehow entitled to retaliate in this brutal way. So uh, I can't say that I am very optimistic about human nature. I mean, obviously, human nature has its potentials to do very good things and to do terrible things. And a uh, combination of circumstances uh, bring forth good or bad. But also there are, you know, clearly some political, this is a good concept which I'm sure you are familiar with, political culture, where some political cultures are clearly more tolerant than others. You know, in the United States, uh, <clears throat> there is a fair amount of institutional right tolerance, so you can say bad things about anybody. I mean, it's a little bit weakened by political correctness, but still, there is a lot of this left. Unlike in Europe, where there are laws against Holocaust denial, which in the United States would be considered an infringement of free speech. So, uh, how a culture becomes more or less tolerant, that's an interesting question. <clears throat> and again, you know, religion goes two ways. Religions can promote tolerance and they can promote intolerance, as we know from history, and not just Muslim, but of course Christianity had its intolerant stages and inquisition and so forth, and witch hunts, and, uh, but at the moment, Islamic uh, religious culture displays the most intolerance, or at least certain elements representing it. But clearly there is a human potential for being intolerant. And, uh, you know, how you are raised, but again, you know, what social or cultural factors determine how you are raised? by your parents. You know, there used to be a theory about Nazism, that Nazism was really rooted in the way the Germans ra raised their children in an authoritarian way. So that's not a very good answer. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm Laura from Bulgaria, and I would like to ask you something connected to what you, uh, you just said. Uh, why do you think that the politically violent behavior and the extremist uh, policies in general, why do you think that they find more supporters than the peaceful ones? Like, it seems like there is much more energy in the, in the brutal behavior than when you promote peace. Yes, you see, this, this, this certainly points to aspects of human nature because immediately I think about the, the variety of violent entertainments which have been historically popular including public executions. There were always huge audiences for public executions, and there still are, and people were not forced to attend them. And of course, there are all these violent athletic sports or entertainments which people enjoy, and all the mass media is full of violence, and people enjoy it. And uh, well, we, we need a good psychologist to explain this kind of thing, but. Uh, There is something exciting about it, or people find it exciting, uh, the spectacles of violence. And as I said, certainly the popularity of violent entertainments points to this potential in human nature. Or, you know, even worse, why do, why do some children torture animals? Well, I think that, that you could say, well, it's a personal pathology, but we just give it a name, that's still something in Again, you know, psychologists would say that, well, there is something very wrong with these children and how they were treated, how they are treated by their parents, and they take it out on animals, etc. But then there are obviously many sources for 
human be beings to turn nasty and brutal. But also, you know, I have, I have to say also, I have lived in the United States for most of my adult life, and uh, <clears throat> while there are many things I am critical of in the United States, I always felt that there are in the United States a huge number of idealistic people. I mean, more than in Europe. That's my ridiculous generalization. Of course, you cannot take a survey of idealistic people or how do you define idealism. But I always felt there is more idealism in America than in Europe, whether it's Western or Eastern Europe. Perhaps one explanation is that, you know, the United States on the whole had a more peaceful history. You know, nobody ever occupied the United States, for example, where there was a bad civil war a long time ago. And uh, there were these racial conflicts. But still, I am always amazed by high levels of idealism in the United States. Uh, and uh, again, you know, compared with my own former country, where Hungarians I consider very unidealistic, un although there are, of course, particular moments in history where they displayed a great deal of idealism, like in 1956 during the revolution. But um, probably idealism flowers better under more peaceful and stable conditions. Fidan from Azerbaijan. I just wanted to ask Azerbaijan. Um, just wanted to ask, how do you see the matter of identity as a solution to political violence or as an initiator of the problem in the beginning? Well, I think sometimes it, it can go both ways. I believe that sometimes people who engage in political violence, thereby they seek to prove or underline or establish a certain sense of identity. Again, I have this analogy with the gang members, that when they are on a kind of trial period, you know, in American gangs I read about, they have to engage in a violent act, and thereby they show their loyalty to the gang and their identity. And uh, <clears throat> I am sure that uh, people who join any kind of violent political organizations and, and engage in actual violence, uh, that helps to cement or solidify their sense of identity and loyalty to the group, the, the, the violent act. But, and you know, another thing which comes to my mind about human nature and violence, I don't know how many of you have seen these pictures. I have seen pictures in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, <clears throat> where you see these Nazis or SS people standing next to the mass graves of people whom they just machine gunned, grinning, smiling, laughing, this kind of thing. Job well done. So uh, you could say that people who have a well-established and perhaps a more traditional sense of identity, I think, for, first of all, I would say that when people have to find a sense of identity in a political movement, I think that that's already more problematic, I think. I think people's sense of identity should be something much more unself-conscious or taken for granted and come from their familiar, familial ties and their occupation, etc. But once you, once you have to join a political movement to develop a satisfactory sense of identity, then I think there is some problem. The question, yes. Well, my name is Adrienne, and I come from Afghanistan. My question concerns uh, the period before, uh, for example, in the case of Nazi system, Jewish people coexisted with, with the rest of German population. I, I was wondering what adds to this quick shift from coexisting within one environment to designating someone or a particular group as a threat. I couldn't hear this. So, could, you, could you repeat it? Maybe so, it in, the, in Nazi Germany, you had many people who um, previously they had lived together and coexisted with the Jewish population. So what leads to this quick shift from uh, yes. coexistence to... That, that's an interesting question. And also, I read the same thing in Rwanda. You know, that neighbors were killing one another who were earlier 
living in apparent harmony. And, uh, and I mean, it happened in, not just in Nazi Germany, it happened in many places. Uh, well, there is one, one very prosaic and crude explanation in Rwanda. What often happened that when the neighbors murdered their neighbors, they took their property. Well, that, that was one explanation. It also happened with the many Jews, you know, when they were deported, they were also expropriated, and often their neighbors benefited from this. And uh, I think also people respond to external pressure, that when the government or the political authorities put a, define a group in society as hostile or inferior or disloyal, that can have a certain effect too. And so, and it's no longer, no longer advisable to associate with them. This is again where political propaganda comes into play. So the government can influence uh, people in these ways. And perhaps the ties to begin with were not that close. Just because you are neighbors doesn't necessarily mean that they were, you were friends. The questions. Hello, my name is Pavel. I'm from Moldova. And um, my question addresses the legitimacy of political violence, and namely, from the point of view of the um, nature of a human. Uh, you, you, you were mentioning how there were a few studies dedicated to the conditions under which a uh, human can commit um, awful deeds. Um, there was a Stanford experiment by Philip Zimbarda, uh, meant to advocate upgrade uh, abusers. Uh, and he came up with uh, certain conditions, namely there were five points, like belief in the, in the fairness of his acts, uh, the bigger purpose. So if, there are, if these conditions are present, a person can commit, commit uh, Oh, a violent act. Uh, so um, we can see how uh, psychologically uh, we are designed in such a way that we can be forced into violence. Uh, then um, the, follow the following um, thought is uh, since it is our nature uh, to uh, since it's our nature to be able uh, to commit a violence under certain circumstances, the ones who are making those circumstances, the ideology with, which creates the environment under which the violence is committed, um, can it be um, ever considered legitimate? Uh, in a sense that, um, to bring an example, fascist under its own um, values committed legitimate violence. Um, Christians killing Muslims uh, during the Crusades was a legitimate act of violence. For us who are upholding democratic values, certain um, act of violence of the past were legitimate. Nevertheless, current acts of, uh, acts of violence, let's say preventing um, peacekeeping interventions, they, are, they, they appear to be legitimate. Uh, so you can see how the, between different ideologies, uh, acts either gain or lose the legitimacy. So can there be an objective? Well, obviously, you know, the, the conclusion of the Milgram studies were very similar to the Zimbardo studies. Uh, this, the importance of the authority figure, you know. I believe in the Milgram study, they even found the distinction when the person who was the supposed scientist and experimenter, when he wore a white coat, you know, he made more of an impact than when he didn't wear one. But anyway, your major question is, how can we distinguish between types of violence uh, which are legitimate, which are not legitimate? Because after all, every movement or country or political system which engages in violence wants to make it seem legitimate. And uh, I think, for example, if, if, if and when legitimate, genuine, genuine, underline it, genuine self-defense is involved, but that's clearly more legitimate. But I said earlier that many political systems invoked and claimed self-defense spuriously when it was not true. 
you know. Even the Nazis, I don't know how many of you know this, the Nazis staged an attack on a border post by Polish soldiers. The Polish soldiers were German dressed as Polish soldiers. And that was the pretext to attack Poland. So, you know, self-defense. So I think it is possible to distinguish between genuine self-defense and spurious self-defense uh, as a source of violence, you know. I think most people agree, for example, that on the whole, the Western powers declaring war on Nazi Germany did the right thing, that this was legitimate. Well, you can't quite call it self-defense because the United States was never in danger of being invaded by Nazi Germany, but perhaps it was in more of a danger of well, it's hard to imagine, but Japan was another story. After all, Japan had this attack on uh, Pearl Harbor. So there are some cases when self-defense is clearly uh, acceptable justification of violence. But what I was emphasizing earlier, that this notion has become very extended, what is self-defense. and. Uh, as to these studies of Zimbardo and Milgram, um, I understand that both of the studies got a lot of criticism in the United States. Um, Milgram actually was a close personal friend of mine, so I know a lot of that. <clears throat> but the Zimbardo studies got more criticism because supposedly Zimbardo somehow intentionally or not, but people said that Zimbardo encouraged the students in some way to act in these brutal ways, even though this was all role playing. Now, there is another st study which comes to my mind, uh, which has relevance to disobedience to authority. Somebody wrote a book in America, his name escapes me, but the title was something like Ordinary Man. And this was about a unit of the German army during World War II, which was not the SS. They were regular soldiers, the Wehrmacht. But they shot a lot of Jews. That was part of their job. They were reservists, many of them, from Hamburg. And they found that uh, the interesting thing was that what, that wasn't even the case of so much obedience for authority because apparently it was possible to get out of this job. If you really didn't want to do it, you could avoid doing it. But most of them didn't get out of it because they felt not so much that it was ob obedience to authority or that the Jews had to be exterminated, but they just felt somebody had to do it. And if they didn't do it, then their comrades had to do it. So it was kind of a had to do with the sense of community, that this was maybe a somewhat dirty job, but we, we had to share in doing it. So that, that's another peculiar kind of, maybe not so peculiar motivation. And certainly it has a situational aspect to it. But it's certainly easier to engage in atrocities if you really believe that uh, you are doing the right thing you know, that you ex exterminate an enemy of the system or a social order you are trying to build or a, or a disbeliever or some kind of a subversive element or somebody who corrupts society and so forth. We have time for one more question. Hello, my name is Victoria, I'm from Russia. Uh, and I was thinking, so if you look at the historical examples, um, for example, with Nazis, uh, their problem, let's say, let's say their problem was Jews, and therefore they were trying to eliminate this problem, okay? And so Jews became their, let's say, like target group. Um, and now, nowadays, what I see in um, like political violence cases, for example, take the recent case in Norway, uh, where like Norwegian uh, citizen, he, um, you know, his political message was he was against. Uh, uh, no, against Norway becoming a multicultural co uh, country, uh, but yet he didn't. Um, his violence wasn't um, addressed. It wasn't connected with this with his let's say target group, as I said. But it was um, 
you know, he killed a lot of like people who were not part of his party group. So we see this shift, um, political violence becoming a means of communicating political, political message connected to some other thing. So what do you think accounts for this shift? Well, I think in this Norwegian case, <coughs> from what I read about it, he killed these people who were associated with left-wing movements in Norway. And he killed them because he held them responsible for making Norway more of a multicultural society. So there was a very strong ideological motivation on his part. And, uh, and, and as you know, he never repented and he, he seems to have remained convinced that he did the right thing. But there was definitely an ideological motivation. Now, you know, in all these cases, a psychologist or psychiatrist might say, this man was really crazy or psychotic, and this was just an excuse to display these violent impulses, and uh, maybe if we study his childhood, we would better understand, or maybe he had too many of, or too few of one genes or another, or maybe there was some chemical malfunction in his brain. So, you know, there are all kinds of explanations of the seemingly incomprehensible violent behavior. You know, like take serial murderers. Now we are out of the political realm. Serial murderers. Okay. Um, we were in here then. Um, Professor Hollander would like to thank you very much for coming to us. And thank you. Very much. Thank you. Some very um, weighty thoughts, uh, heavy thoughts. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience for some really excellent questions, and I hope that you got to know us a little bit and to see uh, the, the multinational character of the EBG right here uh, within a few questions. Let me just say I, I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion, and I enjoyed and appreciated your questions, which were indeed very good and stimulating, and I wish there was more time for questions, and you have given me a very good impression of this institution. <laughs> Thank you. This program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.bg/talks.